Well, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a great pleasure. And I know this is a very busy time of the year. Many for, of you are getting ready for the climate conference in Durban or trying to finish work that uh, you haven't been able to finish so far and getting ready or for the holidays. So uh, this is really a great turnout. And I think it shows uh, the interest uh, in meetings uh, of, of this kind and, of course, of the pre report that we're going to present here today. My name is Alexander Ox. Uh, I am the Director of Climate and Energy at the World Watch Institute, one of the oldest and recently also rated one of the most influential think tanks on energy and climate issues in the world. And I think you're here today probably for at least four reasons. One, you want a free hard copy of a very valuable report, and that's fair. Secondly, you want to listen to two real champions of renewable energy uh, in this very building, representatives uh, Holt and Markey. Thirdly, you want to discuss uh, with us how much longer it will really take us until we can power this country and maybe the globe as a whole with renewables. Uh, you must be here for that reason because that's the topic of this, this session. And fourth and finally, uh, you are here to, to join a dear friend of ours, uh, Mohammed Al Ashri, the chairman of REN21, in presenting this report. Now, you get three out of the four. Uh, you get a free copy. If you haven't gotten one yet, there are more outside. Um, you will listen to representatives Markey and Holt. They're both scheduled to come. Uh, Mr. Markey, sorry, Mr. Holt is on the floor right now from what we know, but they both uh, have confirmed that they will be here with us. Um, we will discuss the topic why, uh, by when we will um, power the, the, the globe with renewables. What you very unfortunately won't have is Mohammed al Ajri in the room. Um, he uh, got down with a terrible flu. I talked to him last night. Uh, he was still hopeful that he would make it. I talked to him this morning again. He sounded even more horrible than last night. Um, it, it, it was just not possible for him, and he's very, very sorry about that. Uh, he wrote me the final text message was, sorry to disappoint you. I think he has never disappointed us. Uh, he's, 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 of course, one of the, the key leaders on, on renewable energy thinking and doing. Uh, and, and all we can do at this point is to make the best out of being here without him um, and, and wish him well and, and hope that he's, he's getting better uh, very soon. Now, for a facilitator or moderator like me, what does this mean? This means real panicking, OK? Uh, he was the one who was supposed to present this report. Um, well, you see a much fuller panel now than just me and the two congressmen, and, and the reason why is, uh, you know, I just can't fill his shoes alone. You see how many people are needed to fill Mohammed's shoes. Um, uh, and, and so we're trying to really make the best out of this. We have a, need some flexibility because we have to accommodate the, the schedules of the congressmen. So, so here's what I suggest we're going to do. I'm going to lead through, uh, first I'm going to introduce the panel, uh, then I'm going to lead through uh, some of the, I think, most interesting um, results, the most interesting insights from this report. Um, then, by then, we will hopefully uh, have been joined by uh, the congressmen. Uh, we ask them to address uh, uh, you uh, and uh, um, uh, present their thoughts uh, on the report and, and, in general, on, on the status of, of renewable energy development and policy here in the United States. Then we open it up. I know we have a number of um, uh, a number of uh, media representatives in the room, so we want to open it up for them. So make to make sure that they get their questions out. This is the launch of a report, so of course it's important for us that that we uh, uh, we find multipliers. Uh, so that's why the first question goes to the media, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, I am not sure how long uh, the congressman can stay with us, but we have a very distinguished panel here that will help me. Uh, answer questions that you have uh, and, and open it really up for discussion uh, on the topic we have today. So having said this, uh, let me introduce you to uh, the panelists who are here by now and then I'm going to uh, um, introduce the congressmen when they are here. Oh, I haven't I prefer, seen you. But I prefer to sit here so I can <coughs> see the first presentation. Good, okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I still would like to, to start with you then. Uh, uh, Representative Rush Hold, uh, he has presented the 12th district in central New Jersey since 1999, uh, if I'm right informed. He's the only physicist uh, in Congress 
um, with a BA from Carleton College in Minnesota and a master's and PhD from NYU. Um, and he's a five-time winner of the television game show Jeopardy. That's, I don't know what's the greatest achievement of all of this, but that's, that seems to be uh, uh, quite something. Um, Representative Hall has held, held positions as a teacher, as a Congressional Science Fellow. He's also an arms control expert. Uh, he used to work at the U.S. Uh, State Department. Um, and he was the assistant director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. I think I was spent uh, some time myself in Princeton. I think it's the largest research facility uh, at Princeton University and also in all of New Jersey. Is that right? Um, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> that is about right. Good. Good. Um, uh, so, so really nobody better here uh, uh, to, to address you. Uh, Representative Hall serves on the Committee on Education and the Workforce and also on the Committee on Natural Resources. He's really a, a well-known expert on renewable energy. So it's a great pleasure and a great honor to have you here. Uh, sh now, I don't know um, whether you uh, heard my, s listened to my suggested um, uh, scheduling. Uh, would you want to speak? For the presentation, well, maybe it's beautiful. Not all for, but to hear some of it. So what I've what I've suggested is I'm going to run through the slides. So uh, Mohammed Al Ajri had to accuse him, excuse himself. He 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 came down with a terrible flu this morning. Uh, I talked to him the last time an hour and a half ago. He just cannot make it. So I'm going to lead through the, some of those slides, and then maybe you can be best next. Is that fine, yeah. is that good? Yeah. All right. Uh, why don't we do this, and then I uh, uh, introduce the rest of the panel after that. Is that good? Good. good. Wonderful. So why don't we start with the first slide here. Uh, I want to say a few words about RAN21 and why World Watch is here uh, to present this report. Uh, uh, we thought we would f facilitate the discussion, but we're presenting it now. We're kind of well uh, uh, prepared to do this. RAN21 is a multi-stakeholder policy network. Um, it includes uh, national governments, local governments, industry, academia, NGOs. It's a really broad network of key leading experts. Um, the rationale is to enable a rapid global transition to renewable energy and to support this transition uh, with objective policy guidance, with high quality information. This is what we're going to present here in the report. Hopefully you will agree with us and uh, to, to, to uh, uh, facilitate exchange among relevant actors. Uh, it has been published since 2005, so this is an annual publication, but still one that's relatively young. Um, and what it, the, the publication tries to do is it tries to give a comprehensive overview of global renewable energy, the global energy situation, and some of the key trends uh, that we see. Uh, now, it is... Le uh, the lead authors of, of the report are two World Watch researchers, two World Watch senior fellows, Jan Janet Sowen and Eric Martineau. Um, and World Watch, or my team at World Watch, is also helping uh, the Secretariat in uh, the data mining, assembling the data in uh, the management of the report. Um, and we've done this for uh, quite a number of years. So uh, World Watch and RAND21 are really strong allies on this. Uh, it's a team of more than 150 researchers worldwide, local, regional experts, experts on specific uh, energy technologies that are contributing to the report. So uh, let's start with the first slide. Um, we're still in the slides in the back? Right. So you know, I'm just going to give you a few snapshots. I don't want to be you know, too detailed here because I think the interesting part is the discussion and you all have the report and bring it home with you and hopefully read it. Uh, so all of what I'm presenting is in there. Uh, it's really just to get the discussion going. So here's a first overview. As of 2009, and that's the latest reliable data uh, across all energy sectors, renewable energy supplied an estimated 16% 16, 16 of global final energy consumption. Most of this comes from traditional biomass, uh, followed by hydropower. But I think what we see here again in, in the report uh, is that the share of others continue to quickly increase, uh, other renewables that is. In 2010, while uh, renewable energies did face uh, challenges relating to the economic crisis, uh, to low natural gas prices, uh, and many other factors, uh, some of which I'm sure we will discuss here, um, renewable energy continued to grow strongly across all major uh, and use sectors. Next slide, please. So uh, over the five-year period from the end of 2005 
uh, through 2010, total capacity uh, of, of uh, most mainstream uh, renewable technologies grew at a rate, rate grew at rates averaging between 15 and 50 percent every year. Uh, in 2010, uh, despite many problems, growth further accelerated in the solar sector. Um, despite the economic crisis, uh, the, the growth accelerated. Uh, biofuels slowed somewhat in recent years, um, but here ethanol saw a significant increase in 2010. And, and another really major finding of this report is that um, there is a new regional diversity in the trends. It's not just a few number of countries anymore that are uh, in the lead of renewables, um, but this is really a, a becoming a global market. Um, it is uh, very important to note that the growth rates in some countries far exceed the already strong level, global level that, that is seen here. Next slide. Now, in the power sector, capacity reached uh, an estimated 1,320 gigawatt in 2010. So if we look at electricity alone, uh, um, the numbers are about 8% up from 2009 numbers. Um, already today, renewable energy accounts for about 25%, one quarter of total global power capacity. So that's not actual production, capacity. Um, but it is about 20% of, uh, uh, of global power production as well, so about one-fifth of actual electricity production. And here's another amazing number. Uh, approximately half of the estimated 194 gigawatts <coughs> of new power capacity that were added in 2010, about half of that came from renewables. Um, wind is the largest share of new renewable energy capacity followed by photovoltaics, uh, amazing growth rates in that sector, and, uh, uh, sorry, followed by, by hydro and then photovoltaics, and, and photovoltaics, of course, is, has uh, uh, seen very, very strong growth rates in 2010. Um, next slide, please. Let's talk about some industry trends very quickly. Um, due to the growing market for renewable energy, we also see continued growth relating to all other indicators. Manufacturing of equipment is up, uh, sales are up and installations are up. Um, now, why is that? Um, one major reason for what we are seeing is clearly cost reductions uh, in a number of, of sectors, most importantly photovoltaic, uh, but also wind turbines and biomass processing technologies have seen costs come down significantly, and that's of course a major contribution uh, to, to seeing, um, um, uh, seeing the, the continued growth in equipment, in installations, and in, in sales. Um, at the same time, what we do observe uh, in 2010 is that there are changing policy landscapes. Uh, and in some countries, and I think we will discuss this here today, it is because of the uncertainty that manufacturers and investors uh, 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 feel. They are concerned about when and how uh, policies might change, and in some cases, uh, concerned about even the potential of retroactive revisions. Um, we've seen that in the reduction of uh, the feed-in tariffs uh, for solar PV in many countries, in some countries, not many, in some countries, particularly in, in Spain. Um, other trends that I think are exciting and uh, that we've seen continue in 2010, there's an increasing internalization of industry. Uh, um, um, uh, renewable energies are produced and installed in more countries than ever before. There's a consolidation, um, most notably in the biomass and biofuel <coughs> sectors, uh, um, and this consolidation stems mostly from the fact that traditional energy companies um, do continue to move into renewable energies. Um, we also see another sign of maturity of the market, which is that there is the development of a vertically integrated supply, supply chain. Um, um, and more and more project, uh, more and more manufacturers are also going into project development these days. So all of these are very, very good signs. Uh, very quickly, some numbers on the jobs front. Uh, 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 renewable energy industries in several countries today provide more than hundreds of thousands uh, uh, of jobs. Overall, direct jobs from what we see are difficult to estimate, but about 3.5 million direct jobs and, and many more 
uh, that that are um, um, relating I indirect jobs uh, um, uh, worldwide. Next slide. Um, let's talk very briefly about just two technologies here: wind and solar, two mainstream, uh, the so-called modern, non-conventional um, uh, uh, renewable technologies. Um, there was more wind power capacity added in 2010 than any other renewable energy uh, technology, and that includes hydro, includes large hydro, and that's a quite uh, a remarkable trend. Um, there's nearly 39 gigawatt installed now. The global total is now approaching 198 gigawatt worldwide. Now, where has this growth happened? China really represented about half of the world wind market in 2010. So out of the 39 gigawatt, 19 were uh, added in China, about half of new additions. Um, uh, and it's followed by the United States and then India. Uh, so the United States comes in quite well here in, in second place. China now leads uh, the world also for total capacity uh, and is in that category also followed by the United States and then Germany. So that's the reason why I sit here probably. Um, so um, the global wind market did hold steady uh, in, in 2009 um, and it held steady. It we would have seen much uh, higher growth um, if, if there wasn't slower growth in two main regions uh, of the past, and that's the, U the United States and, and Europe, where there was uh, depressed demand for electricity because of the economic crisis uh, and some uh, policy uh, uncertainty as well. Uh, we're going to hear more about that possibly uh, here today. Um, but even in those two uh, areas, the manufacturing capacity increased substantially during 2010. Uh, let's talk about solar. Uh, um, it's really one of the most amazing trends in 2010. Uh, total global capacity in 2010 was uh, for PV, photovoltaic, up 72% from the year before. So amazing growth. Additions of about 17 gigawatts of PV. So those of you working in the, f in the field know that, you know, uh, just probably a couple or five years back, nobody would have thought additions of this. Yeah. We would have laughed about this, okay, that additions of this the, the, this would be possible. Um, for the first time in the European Union, for example, a very strong renewable energy market, many would say a leader in that field, um, uh, more PV was added to the grid uh, than, uh, than wind for the first time ever. Um, so another regional trend that we see is that, that Europe, followed by, why, why Europe followed by Japan and the US continues to lead the market overall Manufacturing of PV cells sh uh, continues to shift to Asia um, because of a host of reasons, mostly, of course, uh, 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 cost of production. Um, cost reductions continued, and one just one number here, amazing number, module prices fell a further 14% in 2010 alone. Uh, and there was, you know, this was on top of a drop of 38% in 2009. So very quick cost, cost reductions uh, uh, are uh, playing a major role, of course, here uh, for, for the growth that we, s w that we see. I'm going to skip the next um, uh, one, two, two slides, uh, and going to give a few snapshots about the situation here in the United States. Um, market overview, United States, perfect. Uh, that's good teamwork. Um, so in the US, overall, renewable energy accounted for about 10.9% of domestic primary energy production in 2010, 10.9%. That compares to about 11.3% for nuclear, for example. So we're talking about quite a substantial share here uh, already. Renewables are really on track, and you know, uh, uh, remember these are 2010 numbers, really on uh, with, with enormous growth, uh, about to pass uh, 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 nuclear energy in, in, in terms of the importance, uh, in terms of share of uh, um, um, uh, of domestic energy production. Yeah, this year should be the year that happens. This year should be the year, exactly. So uh, what you see here is, is uh, not a primary energy, it's electricity, uh, total modern, non-conventional, new, innovative, however you want to call it, renewable energy uh, capacity. New additions were 56 gigawatt in addition to the, the 78 gigawatt uh, of, uh, that, that are produced by hydro, which, which we might uh, consider a, a, a convention, at least large hydro, a conventional energy source. Um, 
it is about 25% of electricity capacity that was added in 2010 in this country do come from renewables. So comparing to the 50% globally uh, in that category, the U.S. Um, um, is, is below the global average uh, with only about a quarter of new, new additions. Uh, and um, from my knowledge, that's mostly due to the, the additions in the gas sector, um, um, natural gas, and, and including shale gas. Okay, next uh, slide. Um, we have some numbers here for wind and biomass. Um, you know, let's uh, uh, flip through this. Uh, again, this is, uh, you know, I, the credit for this uh, is shared by Mohammed El Ashri. It's really his presentations. I'm running through this uh, quickly here. Um, solar, uh, we do see a parallel in the U.S. market to what's happening globally, very uh, uh, substantial growth. Um, let's talk about investment flows. Uh, next slide. The capacity and the production have uh, increased in the United States, as I just mentioned. And uh, as this happened, the total global investment in renewable energy has uh, risen several fold since 2004. Uh, uh, um, so to a, a record, actually, $211 billion in 2010. That's the overall investment in, in the renewable energy market. Um, in addition to the $211 billion, we have about an, an estimated, we don't have any uh, uh, good numbers really for that, it's an estimated $15 billion that are invested in solar hot water collectors and an additional 40 to 45 billion invested in conventional large-scale hydro. So the 211 billion do not include uh, hydro and uh, solar hot water. Um, utility scale asset finance. So these are large wind farms, solar parks, uh, and biofuel plants are more than half of the total. So this is not just distributed power, um, but a lot of it uh, actually um, is, uh, is, is really large, large scale, including large scale PV. Next slide. Just want to show this map uh, very quickly uh, because, you know, it's, it's visualizing really some of the major investment trends. And you see also here, not just in terms of new capacities, but also in, in terms of new investments, China is now in the lead um, uh, with about uh, 50 billion invested in that country. Uh, it's followed by Germany, surprisingly, a relatively small country, 41 billion, and then third is the United States, uh, followed by India, uh, and uh, then finally Brazil. Um, next slide, please. We have a slide here uh, on the investment flows in the United States, uh, and you see that after um, uh, a, a peak in uh, 2008, uh, after which investments went uh, down in 2009 for the reasons that I mentioned, uh, we did see an increase in investments again in 2010 overall. And most of this investment here in the country was in the wind sector. A few final words about the policy landscape. Next slide. Um, remarkable policy changes worldwide. Uh, in 2005, we had 55 countries that had either renewable energy targets or policies. In early 2011, we have 118 countries having either targets or policies. So more than half of the countries worldwide now do have either renewable energy targets or policies in place. Um, and what's exciting about that is that of the countries that have targets, 96 countries worldwide that have renewable energy targets, more than half of those are now developing countries. So this is not a rich world uh, uh, um, phenomenon anymore. Um, it's, it's really spreading all across the globe. Uh, developing countries, not just China, many more, many other countries are getting very serious about supporting and advancing renewable energies. Um, the targets usually represent commitments to shares of electricity, 10 to 30 percent in most countries, uh, but also relating to heat supply, uh, to install capacities to share of biofuel. And many countries met their 2010 countries. That's another good news for those of you who are working on policies. Meeting targets is important, uh, and that has happened. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide. Um, 
uh, you, the United States. Um, most of you will follow uh, the political debate here on the Hill closely, I'm sure. Um, this is why we have so distinguished uh, panelists here to talk a little bit more about this. But I think it's important particularly for uh, our international audience, and we do film today, uh, and um, this will be watched by, by uh, hopefully others across the world. I think it's important to point to the fact that in this country, uh, states and municipalities are playing a very important role. So even if we saw comprehensive climate and energy legislation fail uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Congress, um, uh, we do see really uh, uh, districts, municipalities, and states step up to the plate and, uh, and support the federal level in um, providing targets, providing <laughs> policies, and advancing the renewable energy sector. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this. I really want to come to an end here. Um, uh, maybe we can put up the uh, map here. Exactly, that's great. So uh, uh, we're presenting the, the facts of the report here. We're opening a policy discussion here. But if you go to the RAN21 website, you will have a map on there. And you want to dig a little bit deeper into what individual regions are doing. This is a clickable map. And you see at one click, really, what individual countries are, uh, uh, are doing. Uh, and, and this, this um, information um, will, uh, will be growing over the next month. So this is a work in progress, of course, as policies move forward and as the technology moves forward. Um, so this is Mohammed's presentation. Um, uh, I liked it. Uh, I hope you did as well. Um, uh, some improvisation here. And so next, I would uh, uh, like to ask Representative Holt uh, to share his views on the situation. And you can, wherever you want to do it, maybe uh, it's, uh, it, it would be good to have you on the podium, yes. Does the microphone work? Uh, we'll try it, yes. Uh, can you hear back there? Thanks. Uh, I, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alexander Ox uh, and World Watch. I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. I'm pleased to see such a good attendance. Uh, I am not surprised because World Watch is such a reputable actor in, uh, in this field, and uh, uh, actually in, in, in a number of fields. And I, I've always liked working with World Watch studies and World Watch uh, people because they are uh, forward-looking, uh, they are early to recognize trends, um, and they present it without wishful thinking or uh, 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 they present the facts and they uh, present them in a policy-relevant way. So I thank you for this. Uh, uh, this is up to World Watch standards. And I, I thank you very much for, for presenting it. Um, uh, you know, a number of points that, that, that you highlight uh, just uh, make it very clear how much we need to do, uh, we in the policy area. Um, a clear conclusion of this for me is that we shouldn't just sit back and watch. Uh, because what we watch, what we are watching, is um, the rest of the world eating our lunch. Uh, and, um, and our failure to prepare for what we need to prepare for. Um, you know, with wind growing at uh, 39 gigawatts, um, uh, photovoltaics at uh, um, 17 gigawatts um, and actually growing faster now than, than wind even, in, at least in the, in the short term. Uh, with price of photovoltaics falling, um, with uh, US renewables um, growing in a way that um, might uh, not only pass uh, renewable, I mean, uh, nuclear in 2012, it might, the non-hydro part of, of uh, renewables is on a path to pass nuclear in the uh, certainly foreseeable, maybe even near future. Um, it's noteworthy that half of the uh, new electric capacity is renewable um, and 
uh, and, and on and on. I don't need to repeat the, uh, uh, all of the items that, uh, that we've heard from Alexander uh, right now. Uh, I am uh, drawn to note, though, that this is the result of policies. Uh, and so many of the countries, I guess 50 around the world, that have uh, renewable energy policies, so many of them are uh, much more aggressive than ours. <coughs> the, um, I, I'm pleased that uh, New Jersey actually has had uh, very good policies, and New Jersey uh, in recent years has had more photovoltaic uh, capacity installed than any state in the country except California. And this is not on a per capita basis. This is in, in, in actual watts. And uh, so I'm pleased about that, but it's the commitment to it in New Jersey is starting to slip as I see it starting to slip in a number of other places. Uh, the interest in climate change, I'm sorry to note, uh, has, uh, has diminished uh, in this country. And uh, just at a time that I think the attention should be increasing. We can talk about what the reason is, but I would argue that for reasons of international, uh, uh, comparison with international investment or any number of other reasons, uh, we should have what used to be called a no regrets strategy that even if uh, you don't want to engage uh, the, the, the large number of members of Congress who would prefer to either deny or ignore climate change, uh, even if you don't want to engage them on that subject, there are plenty of reasons why we should be making these investments and why we should be setting um, uh, policies in place uh, that move us more rapidly on this transition. Uh, you know, whether it's the 1603 Treasury Grant Program or any number of other policies, various kinds of renewable uh, portfolio standards, um, it is clear that uh, it is those things that have been driving this around the world. And they haven't been driving it artificially. There is real reason to invest in these things. They are proving themselves well. Um, so it is something where we should be in making the, setting these standards and making these investments because we recognize reality. Some of the opponents here of setting these policies will say, well, government shouldn't be picking winners. Uh, no, I think we are just recognizing winners, and that's what we should be doing uh, in setting these standards. Um, or put another way, it sure would be better to be selling these technologies to the world than buying them from the world. Uh, so putting in place uh, uh, standards that uh, promote the development, I think, is a um, financially sound strategy. Um, with China just very recently passing us an investment, but passing us almost as if we are standing still, so that they're now investing more than one and a half times uh, what the United States is investing, ought to be wake up call enough. Uh, so I thank uh, World Watch for. Uh, giving us, again, uh, a policy-relevant uh, account uh, based in real data and real facts uh, that should lead us to put in place standards that will move us along uh, considerably faster than we have been moving. Thank you. Now, would you have time for a few questions, uh, Mr. Olin? Uh, sure. Yeah. Not to detract from uh, 
the other presentations. Though, and that's, but, but you're the MC. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I would like to open it up at this point. Um, um, we have a, a good group of people in, in the audience who, who are probably having smart questions. I have quite a number, but I, I want to really give you a first, and particularly the media folks who are here. If you um, uh, would uh, be so kind to uh, introduce yourself, uh, um, who are you with, and uh, ask uh, questions particularly to Representative Holt at this point. Any questions here? We have, I think, a microphone here in the middle of the room. No questions? Ah, oh, there we go. So please, why don't you line up here at the, at the phone, if that's OK? Yes. There wasn't going to be another question. I'm Jan Lundberg with the Sail Transport Network. And Congressman, I was wondering what you might think of a very efficient form of renewable energy for transport, given that in a post-peak oil world, um, it's going to be tough to have all this bunker fuel uh, that is very subsidized now and very polluting, uh, providing uh, the basis for all this world trade. So uh, your comments would be uh, Well, it's, well. it is an efficient and time-tested uh, uh, technology. Uh, I, I, the, um, um, The, you know, a number of transitions that we've made in the way we do things, in transportation, in home design, in, uh, you could just go down the list, uh, have come about over the last uh, century or so uh, when the uh, cost of, of energy seemed to be coming, seemed to be cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and the externalities could be ignored. Uh, that is no longer the case. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in some ways we should be, uh, we, there, there is a, a little bit of a silver lining. For example, we can recapture jobs from China now uh, simply because the cost of transporting things, materials to China and products from China, uh, are. are uh, no longer undercut us quite as much uh, because of the uh, energy costs in the transportation. Uh, but that's, a, uh, that's grasping for a silver lining uh, in what really is, uh, where the message really is that uh, transportation based on fossil fuels is uh, enormously expensive and becoming more so. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question and then we need to move on. My name is Ami Tabinun. I'm at the DOE. I wanted to thank you for that really passionate point, the passionate and important pointing out of what the leading reasons are for needing renewable energy. As you know, the New York Times put out a report this weekend in which they criticized the government's support of renewables and saying that the, the combined federal and state subsidies are, bring investments in renewable energies to the point of a guaranteed profit. I was wondering if you could comment about the facts on the ground and what you see the government's role as in terms of maintaining that balance for encouraging investment but not subsidizing. You know, here on the Hill this week, uh, there is a, uh, there's another hearing about uh, the failure of a solar energy manufacturer. Um, and it will all be about um, uh, poor business decisions and governmental uh, short-sightedness. And that completely misses the point. What happened here is that every, solar, every photovoltaic industry in the United States, whether they were well-managed or poorly managed, has been undercut by a huge investment in China in photovoltaic manufacture. A huge investment that dwarfs anything that we've been talking about in loan guarantees or outright grants. Uh, and that, uh, it's, it's small wonder that uh, uh, more and more installed photovoltaic uh, capacity in the United States is with non-American collectors. Um, so, I think that that uh, uh, far, uh, uh, far from um, uh, 
demonstrating the, the um, folly of government support for these industries, it should be seen as, in fact, a major endorsement of government support if we hope to be competitive uh, in the world market. Thank you very much, Representative uh, Hold. Uh, please give the Congressman a, a final hand. And I, I don't know when you're going to leave us and, and being so focused on so many things. Uh, I want to make sure that you have a state of the world report from this year. Uh, I think I do. But good, good. Well, you have a second copy. And this is a signed one by our president. So it's and Rush will be tested on that. <laughs> now, uh, I told you we need to improvise because we have a lot of very important people here uh, who are on very tight schedules. And the more it is an honor to... Uh, have, uh, in addition to Representative Rush Holt, Representative uh, Edward Markey here with us. Uh, really a great honor uh, as he is one of the, clearly the national leaders on, on energy and the environment in general here in this country. Uh, um, Mr. Markey has represented Massachusetts's seventh, that's difficult for a German to say by the way, Massachusetts, <laughs> you get it, seventh congressional district since 1976. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's the ranking member of the Natural Resource Committee, I think, ever since he joined Congress in 1976. I've been on the committee, yeah. on the, Being on the committee, of course, just recently, or, or just now the ranking member. Uh, he has fought very hard to create uh, new jobs in American clean energy. Uh, he's, he's really a consumer champion also against rising gas prices and foreign uh, oil. Uh, and in uh, between 2007 and 2010, <coughs> Uh, at the direction of then Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Representative Markey served as chairman of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, a committee that has uh, held more than 80 hearings and briefings uh, on the advancement of smarter energy uh, and on the advancement uh, of climate policies. Uh, amongst other things, uh, this committee has increased fuel economy standards in this country for the first time in three decades. Uh, and this was legislation that Representative Markey authored. Uh, so we thank you very much uh, for being with us on a very busy day. And the floor is yours. Okay, beautiful. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> thank you, Alex, uh, so much. And, uh, um, and uh, it's great following my friend, uh, Rush Holt. Uh, he and I partner working on all of these issues and uh, as you all know uh, in a competition between him and the computer um, Watson just uh, six months ago Rush Holt won and Watson lost okay so you don't have to be uh, a nuclear physicist uh, rocket science scientist to understand all these issues but it doesn't hurt in two years, okay? so so that's uh, you know so that's why it's so great to uh, be here with uh, rush and thank you Alex very much for uh, having me here uh, with you uh, and uh, and thank you for this uh, report which you're rolling out today I mean I think it basically is bringing a lot of reality uh, to what is still uh, a a misunderstood area of the uh, of the global economy. 194,000 megawatts of new electrical capacity was installed worldwide last year. 194,000 new megawatts. Of that, one half was renewable power. So, this is unbelievable. I mean, this fact has been locked into a witness protection program here, okay, where it, the information doesn't get out, huh? Right. So that's a phenomenal number, huh? Big success story. Uh, as people say, oh, it'll never be able to compete with coal, never be able to compete with nuclear. Mm -hmm. One half in 2010, huh? What does 2015 hold? What does 2020 hold uh, if that's where we are already? 17,000 megawatts of solar was brought online worldwide last year, 17,000 megawatts. That means for every new nuclear power plant that went online last year in the world, four times as much new solar capacity was deployed. 2010, four times as much new solar deployed as nuclear, you know, as 
you know, as, uh, as people keep saying, well, how can it ever uh, compete? Uh, solar deployments have grown more than 1,000% in the last five years. 1,000% in five years. Uh, we now have five megawatt wind turbines being deployed. Uh, wind power is now being sold for as little as three cents per kilowatt hour in the United States. Now that's still with the tax breaks, but three cents a kilowatt hour in the United States today. Uh, to say the writing is on the wall would be putting it mildly. There is a global renewable energy revolution going on. It is unequivocal. Unfortunately, what's unequivocal to most people like global warming and renewable energy revolution has a tendency to get confused in Congress. Uh, and it gets confused because big oil and big coal spend a lot of money to make sure that people don't understand this central technological reality, this revolution uh, which is taking place. Uh, according to Global Status Report, renewables deliver nearly 25% of the global electricity supply today. Okay, say that again. Today, renewables uh, actually provide 25% of all electrical supply. Now, a lot of that is hydro. A lot of that's hydro. But still, it's a renewable. Uh, and uh, it's a sector that is growing by leaps and bounds. Now, I had legislation that passed in 2009 through the House of Representatives that would increase the renewable electricity standard to 20% by 2020 in the mm -hmm. United States. And it passed in the House of Representatives Absolutely. in 2009. Uh, it was defeated in the Senate. And you can imagine the view that the nuclear and the coal industry had towards that legislation over there. All you need are 40 votes to kill anything over there. Uh, and, uh, and I have legislation uh, that I've introduced to have it go to 25% renewables by 2025 um, that I've, I've now introduced. Again, aiming towards this goal of having an enormous revolution that is built upon the incredible success that has already um, occurred. Now, granted, my renewable electricity standard excludes existing high hydro, excludes it, uh, which already in the United States makes up for 7% uh, of all electrical generating capacity. Uh, but let's think about where the technology will be in 14 years, 2025. Today, onshore wind is already competitive with natural gas in many parts of the country, five, seven cents per kilowatt hour, unsubsidized. Can I say that again? In Many parts of the country, five to seven cents a kilowatt hour unsubsidized. Same with geothermal and some biomass projects, five to seven cents a kilowatt hour today. Utility scale solar is a bit more expensive, about 12 to 15 cents per kilowatt hour, but that price is coming down. Now, there is a Moore's law in effect for solar, and there has been since the 1970s. Every time deployment of solar PV doubles worldwide, the price drops by 18%. It's been an immutable rule for now close to 40 years. At least that was the case, and Rush talked about this. At least that was the case until last year. In response to the effort which the Democrats paid in 2009 to fund solar and wind and new batteries. China, in 2010, then threw $30 billion in financing behind their four solar companies last year. And what happened to Moore's Law for Solar, the 18% drop? Well, from January 1st of this year, until September 30th of this year, the price of solar dropped 42% in only nine months. So this is what's chilling the bones of the coal industry. This is what's chilling the bones of the nuclear industry. This is not supposed to happen. This is a telescoping of a time frame 
in the deployment of solar and a concomitant reduction in the price uh, that is making it more and more affordable and pulling closer the day when renewables are generating electricity at the price of coal. And we know what that day means. Okay? And we also know what that day means in terms of who makes that breakthrough. Because whoever makes the big breakthrough with the solar technology that reduces it down to the price of coal will become the wealthiest person in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Because that person will have the patent, will have the copyright huh? right. on something that's going into right. villages in Africa, and Asia, and South America, rural America. You know? Who will need to big, build these big electrical generating facilities if solar is now at the price of coal. So that is what they are most afraid of. When consumers are able to get their electricity cheaper from solar panels on the roof than from a coal-fired power plant 100 miles away, what will they choose? When consumers can drive the same distance on either $4 worth of gasoline or 75 cents worth of electricity, what will they choose? This is what's driving the automotive sector. This is what's driving the utility sector, the coal, the nuclear sectors of not only our country, but of the whole planet. And so that's the, the big issue for us, okay? That we can't trade the US addiction for foreign oil with an addiction to Chinese batteries and Chinese solar plant panels. Uh, we will have squandered the economic opportunity of a generation. We need a plan in our country. We need a plan. We don't have to fear the Chinese, but we should respect them. They have a plan. What is our plan? And there is no plan as long as the Republicans continue to side with these older industries that see the writing on the wall and they're just trying to make sure that they push back the day uh, when these new technologies become competitive. Now, here are some incredible numbers. You ready? There are now 85,000 coal miners in the United States. You know, there were a million you know, decades ago. Now we're down to 85,000 coal miners. How many people work in the wind industry in the United States right now? 75,000 are in the wind industry in the United States today. How many people are in the solar industry? 100,000 people are now working in solar in the United States. Coal, 85. Wind, 75. Solar, 100. Huh? And we started from zero. Huh? Right. So this thing is skyrocketing, and they know it. So the, <laughs> the um, the oil and gas industries, they have tax breaks on the books that are permanent. The wind and solar industry that Rush and I uh, fight for, they have tax breaks on the books that we have to fight to renew every two or three years. Huh? Correct. And whose plan is that? Huh? Who would want to have theirs be permanent and the competitors, the future, be uh, something that has to be fought for uh, periodically? And we all know that the bill that would have launched this revolution, um, something that Rush and I worked on, was the Waxman-Markey bill um, that passed the House in June of 2009 that would have created this tremendous revolution, putting a price on carbon, creating carbon markets, having dramatic increase in the fuel, the efficiency of the appliances, the buildings that we use, uh, but incentivizing investment in new technologies that could meet this goal of carbon avoidance while still creating new companies, new industries, and making a profit, uh, and setting us up for the 21st uh, century. And, and how do we know that this is possible? The reason that we know that this is possible is that we just did it. And I happen to be the author of the three bills in the 1990s that did it, that, that created this broadband revolution that moved us from black rotary dial phones to blackberries, that moved us from 1990 with everyone using a typewriter to 2011 
with uh, people right now looking at their Blackberries while they're talking, while they're listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And I'm proud of that revolution, by the way. I'm very proud. I'm proud that people can be here and still not be listening to me, you know? And that's, I mean, come on, it's a tribute to the work I did in the 1990s. Well, that's my hope. We have votes in two minutes. They start in two minutes or they end in two they minutes? They end in three minutes. They end in three minutes. Okay, so here's the bottom line. Okay. Here's the bottom line. Huh? You like what you've heard so far? Okay, pretty good stuff, huh? So we're winning, and we just have to do a better job of getting our word out. In 2001, I brought my amendment out on the floor to increase fuel economy standards to 35 miles per gallon. I got 155 votes. Then I brought it out the next year, 162 votes. Then I brought it out the next year, 177 votes. Just kept going and going. Then we took over the Democrats in 2007. And so my language was included in the final bill that President Bush signed after having opposed it for the first six years of his administration. And now, pursuant to that law, President Obama has now promulgated the regulations, because we gave him the authority in the bill, 54.5 miles per gallon by 2026. You hear that? Yeah, yeah. 54.5. And you know what we have now? Every time you turn on the TV, it's an ad for a Volt, it's an ad for a Nissan, it's an ad for a, you know, a, a new hybrid, huh? So we know we can do it. And we can do the same thing over in electricity generation, match up the renewable energy electricity generation with the all electric vehicles, reduce the amount of carbon that goes into the atmosphere, create the jobs here uh, in the United States. Tell the, uh, the OPEC that we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand and revolutionize the relationship between the United States and ordinary people uh, in these fossil fuels of the 19th and 20th century. Thank you all so, so much for everything. Thank you so much, Mr. Markin. We really appreciate it. I know, you, I know you're eager to have one of these. I got it. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. State of the world. <laughs> Not bad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see, see you. Scott's Yes, I know you, Scott. Good to see you. So if congressmen uh, stay at an event until 45 seconds before the vote ends, I think that's a pretty good sign that they are interested in this, and this gives us all hope that policy is changing here. Uh, now, I know we've scheduled this for an hour, so those of you who are on very tight schedules today, um, I understand, we understand if you need to leave us now, but we do have the room for a little bit longer. And I, I haven't asked these gentlemen here uh, for no reason to join me, um, because they are very excellent experts in the field. Um, I want to open up the discussion a little bit to questions, but uh, first of all, uh, ask you to introduce yourself uh, now that um, Scott wrote down his bio on three pages. I'm going to give him, give him the chance to introduce himself in three sentences. Scott, why don't you start first, please, to intru Just introduce yourself? Is that it? I, Just Scott introduction. Sklar, Hold on. What we do is, Scott, give us uh, three sentences about yourself and then formulate one key issue for how this country can be moved forward and can uh, advance renewable energies. I run a company for 11 and a half years in renewables called the Stella Group. I'm an adjunct professor at GW, and I've been in the field 30 plus years. Uh, if you were in my GW class, you would learn that there have been 24 peer-reviewed studies in the last three and a half years that said the world or the United States could meet almost all or all of their energy needs with a blend of high-value energy efficiency and renewable energy. And so the, and the REN21 report is important because that's our report card. That's what's happening. So how do we move? We move there by really what the rest of the world is doing is through state and local governments, sometimes cooperatives, uh, regional ventures, to drive the implementation side. And in my projects globally in India, Australia, here in the United States, it's really driven by the state and local governments, not just policy, but capital formation, retraining the workforce so we can move from the dial phone world into the wireless cellular world. We can move from the traditional central station power to distributed generation and very smart grids. So that's my opening. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next to Scott is Dave Medaris. Um, Dale, a few words about yourself and, and, and maybe, you know, a local perspective here uh, on, on the issue. What are you, I know you're doing a lot of great work in Northern Virginia, so 
tell us a little bit about how you think you can contribute to advancing renewables. Great, thanks Alex. So I'm a senior environmental planner for Regional Council of Governments in Northern Virginia. I've been there for four years. Prior to that, I spent 20 years in the Office of International Affairs at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm also an adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins University. And there's two problems that we've addressed simultaneously within the last three years. The first dealing with comprehensive energy strategies. We prepared uh, two plans, one for Loudoun County and the second in Arlington, on which uh, Scott helped us, which are recognized now by the National Association of Counties as national models because of their comprehensive nature and the quantitative benchmarks and targets that we've set between now and 2050. The second issue, uh, and Scott and I can talk later after our other guests have had the chance to introduce themselves, but the, the second point that I'd like to raise, which we can discuss perhaps if there's time, is the way in which these plans were informed by best practices, uh, land use, renewable energy, uh, climate mitigation, transportation strategies from abroad. Local authorities suffer, I think, from the stigma that international work is irrelevant, it's marginal, and it's confined to the corner of sort of soft sister cities cultural exchanges. And over the course of the past four years, through our work with regions like Stuttgart, Copenhagen, uh, other best practices European regions, we've created what we call problem-focused, goal-oriented, geographically specific exchanges of lessons. It's been a long-term process in which we've married understanding of the content of renewable energy policies, district energy policies, passive housing policies from these cities, and introduced it into the process of figuring out which components and pieces of these innovations can be applied into a very, very unique political, uh, economic, environmental environment of Northern Virginia. And that's very, very important because I think in the past there's this tendency to think that this Learning is automatic. It's going to happen if you send a mayor to spend a week studying Freiburg and Germany's feed and tariff systems. It doesn't happen that way. And what we've done is, again, set up arguably not only the probably best local energy management and climate mitigation plan in the United States, but we've also set up the best, most formal and structured learning process by local authorities in the United States. Thank you very much, Deo. So you have a local, regional perspective, rather. You have an industry's perspective here, one of really the key thinkers in, in all renewables, but particularly solar. I'm turning to my left here, and we have here with us Paul Suding. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we were just introduced this morning uh, uh, because he wears uh, many different hats. He's going to tell you a little bit more about in, in a second. But he's one of the co-founders, or one of the founders of, of, of REN21. Is that right? Well, founders, uh, I was uh, there when it started, and I became the first uh, head of the secretariat, and uh, I'm very proud to, to see this. Of course, uh, we started this with Eric Martino, and uh, we introduced Janet to beef it up and create all this, this uh, researcher's network, etc. So <coughs> that was uh, an assignment which I did uh, in the meantime. I have been two years in Egypt to help uh, develop renewable energy. Before, I was six years in China to do the same thing. So you may imagine that uh, I work for the German International Development Corporation, and I have been assigned to numerous places. I'm an energy economist by training from the University of Cologne 35 years ago, and uh, currently, I work at IDB here in town uh, and uh, help to mainstream, well, this, is, this has happened. We have managed to mainstream renewable energy within uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, now we are pushing it to scale it up. I would like to say that I think the main work, and maybe it was also quite uh, helpful, uh, <coughs> similar things uh, in, in um, Egypt, developing uh, regulations, land use um, uh, rules, how renewable energy can be uh, installed in, uh, in the desert, which is in most cases public land. Uh, and develop also um, framework for private 
investors or uh, those who can sell then elect electricity from wind or solar to the grid. Of course, this, uh, these last uh, two years in Egypt um, uh, were also full of talk about, I don't know if you heard about this, Desert Tech uh, initiative, which is a huge initiative which is considering to import renewable energy from the Sahara to Europe. Um, <coughs> this is quite a difficult thing. However, um, there is uh, quite a lot of support, and we may see the first really large-scale uh, installation in Morocco now, soon. It will probably be a CSP plant. Um, and Morocco is, in a, of course, in a much better situation than other countries from the vicinity, from the possibility to to uh, transport uh, the electricity and also the country has quite high electricity uh, prices already and doesn't have oil, whereas other countries uh, consider more their oil and gas uh, uh, as their basis and may consider to diversify their exports in that sense. Um, well, what we see there, of course, is, uh, and what we have, have heard today, is the very strong decrease in PV prices, which is not the same for CSP, for, for concentrating solar power, so that the initial uh, preference for concentrating solar power may now turn to uh, photovoltaics. That may be a global trend again, but I just wanted to give you some examples of, uh, of my work in the last uh, 10 years. And um, if there are any questions on regional issues, comparisons, or on, on Latin America now where I'm working on, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Paul. So here's your international perspective. Somebody who has worked probably in about half of the countries of this world. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether I'm exaggerating here, but of here, many more than I've visited in my life, that's for sure. Uh, James Bradbury is to the very left, um, and I have to thank James. He has uh, very early on helped us to set this meeting up. Uh, it, now what you've seen here, the result is all in our responsibility, but uh, he's a dear old friend, somebody who has worked here on the, on the Hill for many, many years. Um, so uh, if you want to ask him questions about how things have changed here on the Hill from the time when he has been here, um, he's the right one. Uh, really to address this question to, and um, he's now with the World Resource Institute. Maybe a word about yourself and then uh, uh, a sentence about an observation that, that you want to share with the audience, and then we want to open it up to, to questions and thoughts from the audience. Sure, I'd love to get to questions and discussion. Uh, I'm with the World Resources Institute, which is where I've been for the past two years. Prior to that, I was with Congressman Jay Inslee, um, worked very closely on Waxman Markey. Uh, Mr. Inslee is on the key subcommittee, Mr. Markey's subcommittee um, on the Energy and Commerce Committee. So that was a great learning experience for me on the legislative process. Prior to that, I was a climate research scientist, and so my background is in, in, in climate science. And uh, the, I guess that leads to the, the point I would make. There, I think this is a very valuable study. It's been a really enjoyable discussion. I look forward to um, more discussion. Uh, I would direct uh, folks just to a couple other studies. Um, one is, um, I'm always amazed how few people know about this study, is the Hidden Cost of Energy by the, Nas uh, the National Academy of Sciences, came out a couple years ago, shows that uh, fossil energy, I always cringe every time people say coal is cheap because it's, it's, it's not cheap. It's uh, just the most conservative estimates of the health impacts associated with just uh, PM 2.5, I think NOx and SOx, these, these sort of conventional pollutants, is about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So that's not cheap. That's, that's a big cost that all of us bear in our healthcare um, expenditures. So um, that's just one stat, really valuable, important report. The other one came out just last week by the IEA, and uh, it, they did the most thorough analysis ever of the uh, global energy infrastructure and found that, um, this is not Greenpeace, this is the IEA, um, found that we are running out of time very rapidly within the next five years of avoiding um, dangerous levels of climate change. And the reason is um, what should be obvious, but people don't necessarily recognize that any new infrastructure you put in, 
into it, put into place will be around for decades. And uh, you're locking in these fossil uh, technologies for a long time when you build new infrastructure. And so we obviously need policy to, um, to guide investments to the infrastructure of tomorrow um, and not of yesterday. Thank you very much, James. So we have about 10 more minutes uh, for questions and to open it up. Um, there's a microphone again here in the middle. Um, direct questions relating to the report or any of the speakers, please go ahead. And please introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Erica. I'm just an independent blogger at this point. <laughs> huh. um, I attended the um, Tar Sands rally last Sunday, Sunday before last, and James Hansen mentioned an organization called something to do with Citizens Climate Coalition, perhaps, yeah. and they're uh, proposing a bill that is called something the in dividend. So, using the money generated from taxing dirty um, in energy sources and putting that into balancing the budget. Um, I want to know if, I, I know Mar uh, Congressman Markey left and he said he's proposed something too. Um, what's the possibility of something like this passing? And I guess this is mostly for James. Um, James, well, what, I, what I would suggest just in the interest of time, uh, let's collect a few questions. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? No? Okay, then go ahead, James. Okay, great. Um, the, the last part, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to avoid getting into uh, political <coughs> sort of predictions. But um, Australia just, just passed a carbon price, which is actually very much like a fee and dividend. Mm -hmm. um, to be clear, if you have the dividend, you aren't balancing the budget. Um, so you sort of have to do one or the other. And there, there are uh, conversations going on for, for sure about what the role of a carbon price could be uh, in, a, in a, a broad tax reform, fiscal um, reform type of legislative package at think tanks uh, largely and a lot of members of uh, I guess public uh, members of Congress and uh, members of corporations are, are shying away from engaging in those those conversations generally which doesn't indicate that the chances are too good in, in the near term um, one refreshing exception over the weekend uh, uh, Marvin Odom the president of Shell Oil um, where there was he had a little a number of different experts had little brief blurbs in the Washington Post business section, uh, they had a little special called Power Up America, and uh, he said a price on carbon, I think I actually have the quote here, um, you have to address the issue of putting a price on carbon in some fair, reasonable, predictable way of doing this, I think is the right thing to do. So if you can get the head of one of the major oil companies agreeing, I think um, it's just the writings on the wall, it's just a question of when. And, and Senators uh, Cantwell uh, from Washington, Democrat, and Collins, Republican from Maine, inter introduced uh, a cap and dividend bill that they're looking at to do price and dividend. But the whole point is there is a moderate center, believe it or not, here in Washington, though hard to see. And, um, and I think uh, as the, we get through the election, uh, you'll start seeing the, the moderates uh, rise to control rather than, um, as one uh, great commentator put it in the recent Ohio election, uh, the wackos on the left and the nut jobs on the right. And I think that's really what uh, we'll see, but it's going to be after the presidential election. Any other questions? That's somebody I recognize. Lord Stephen, Office of Science and Innovation, Swedish Embassy. I recently learned about the new financing model for solar PV uh, for residential and also for commercial buildings where you lease uh, the building in order to get away from the consumer having to pay the first cost of actually having it installed. Right. How important would you say, and I'm not sure actually who would be the best expert on that, would you say that this is for the, the increase of solar in, in the U.S.? Um, I'll start with that since I'm a private sector guy. Um, power purchase agreements and leasing and shared savings have been the three tools to get rid to to address the high capital cost. And in all three cases, the consumer doesn't put any money up front. The project gets built, 
those that build it t take the tax incentives, get the financing, and then, e then charge that consumer an, an energy rate that's, that shares either the savings they reduce or is slightly lower than the electric bill they'll pay. But their electricity prices, and I will do this on a stack of Bibles, are going to go up while generically the renewables are pretty well flatlined except for some O&M operation maintenance costs. So that is what's driving most of what I call the larger scale, and the larger scale meaning small business, right up to, to utility scale solar and other renewables, including high value energy efficiency from geothermal heat pumps and li advanced lighting systems and everything else. So it is the innovation we needed to deal with the higher capital costs because you're really paying your fuel is free, but you're paying fundamentally all your energy costs up front. And I, and I mentioned even on my own home, you know, when I put a solar water heating system, it added $3.22 a month, but saved me $19 a month in electricity bills. So as you uh, do that amortization over the warranty life of the system, uh, you can make this cash positive the day you do it. And that's what this revolution in financing is almost as important as the revolution in technology. Dave, do you want to add anything to that? I know you have really an urban planning uh, perspective. Um, uh, no? Okay. He's just trying to make it easier to do this stuff. That's what we're trying to do. And he's pretty good in it. <coughs> Hi, my name is Richard Bell. Uh, I'm the author of the Sierra Club ebook, Nuke Speak. I'm also a former world watcher. Years ago. Um, but my question is about natural gas and the enthusiasm in certain quarters for natural gas as a bridging fuel to the renewable future, uh, and particularly natural gas from fracking and from the shale formations. And I wonder if anybody on the committee would like to address how they see natural gas fitting in or not uh, in making this transition. I'll take maybe, it, I'll maybe take James, it, yes. I'll take a crack at it. Um, there, I mean, there are a bunch of different issues that come up. In terms of specifically the, the transition, um, I was yesterday morning, Resources for the Future held an, an event um, uh, rolling out their, their big uh, natural gas initiative, which is to, to look at how you can sustainably develop, how and if you can sustainably develop shale gas resources, and, uh, and if so, then, you know, then maybe, maybe we should. So, that was sort of their, so it was, um, it was, it was a useful forum, useful discussion. You know, they kicked it off by pointing to some modeling analysis that they've done, and a couple different models. They found that uh, switching by, by having this low price of natural gas that we have as a result of this abundant supply that's being tapped now, shale gas resources. Um, the first modeling set of scenarios found that you're actually squeezing out renewables, so, and, and actually you're seeing a rise in CO2 emissions. So you aren't actually displacing, economics are such that you're not really displacing coal as much as you're displacing efficiency and renewables exactly. according to this modeling. Um, another model run they did, a different model, um, this was the Haiku, the previous one was NEMS. Um, it was very similar, it was a, a marginal reduction, but, but this is not solving the climate problem. So I think that's an important thing. The other important takeaway is it's not like you're just replacing coal. There are, you know, th there are gonna be, s s I think, scenarios in the next few years where there will be coal replaced by natural gas on the grid, and I think in general that will be a positive thing from a life cycle emission standpoint, most likely, um, as far as we know. But, um, Okay. But that there's a real issue in the near term of sort of crowding out, if you will, the renewables and potentially over time this lock-in issue uh, that I spoke to a few minutes ago. Um, but with that said, um, certainly natural gas plants, as we know, can cycle on and off to the extent that you have uh, a lot more renewables on the grid. Again, to the extent that you have a lot more renewables on the grid, natural gas can be um, a useful complement to that. But um, anyway, there are concerns. Uh, I, share, uh, I share the last comment, um, but I do want to point out what most people do not understand is we use the same amount of water uh, to generate electricity as we do for food. 
and you're creating steam. That steam doesn't, that water doesn't land necessarily back here at all. And so, uh, and water resources are becoming uh, as challenging, even more so than energy resources. And in fact, where I live in Arlington, uh, water costs more than electricity when you really look at it. So this idea that the United States is going to build, uh, as McCain said, you know, 68 new nuclear power plants, or we're going to use our precious water for fracking uh, in the billions of gallons and, and make it dirty, in fact, or unretrievable in holes underneath the water table is sheer fantasy. Um, for the short term, the market will absorb it, natural gas prices will go down, and I think renewables and efficiency will be deterred. But over the long term, it's not a sustainable process, and when I mean long term, in a decade, because we do not have the water resources. And you have to choose, you know, we argue about biofuels on food versus fuel. This, the, this issue pales in comparison of looking at precious water resources to deal with uh, breaking up um, natural gas underground. I don't think it's sustainable, and most of the analysis on water, not energy, do not believe it's sustainable. So I don't want to abuse my uh, rights here as a, as a moderator. Okay, moderator. Uh, <laughs> uh, Watch has done a lot of work on the issue of natural gas and renewable energy integration. We've tried to take a very careful approach. We want to go to renewables and efficiency and smart grids, the three main components of a really clean, sustainable future as quickly as we can. But we're also not dreamers and think that this happens overnight. So I, I would just <coughs> at this point say it's about smart policies that make sure that, re that natural gas, uh, um, harnessing natural gas is not in the way of renewables and energy efficiency and any of this, those things that we want to see as quickly as possible. It's about smart policies yet again. I think that's maybe a good way to end this. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and some, some final uh, words, if, if, if you allow me. Um, I think we uh, have done our best to present a, a report uh, that is best when it is actually read. So make, make sure when you do that, uh, that you do that. Uh, we have listened to very exciting remarks from two of the real leaders, the two real champions here uh, in Congress um, uh, on a very hectic day, uh, and I'm very, very pleased that we could, could present them to you. We had, uh, I think, some short but great interventions uh, from my friends here on the podium, so I would ask you to give them a hand very quickly. And uh, so that leaves me with some final thank you words. I'm not going to be long, but I want to really thank you for uh, coming here, for sharing an interest in an issue um, that, that uh, will you know, uh, be one of the key pillars of advancing this country, be in the interest of this country and, 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 and in the interest of the wealth uh, of, of the planet. And uh, you know, always remember that sustainability is not just environmental susta sustainability, but it is economic sustainability and it's social sustainability at the same point. And only if we bring these three you know, main components of sustainability together, we're going to be really able to solve some of the major uh, world, world problems here. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thanks to the panelists. And finally, I want to really thank my team, who is already wrapping up things. They're so concentrated on the work, they don't even hear me. Hello. Uh, they, they're all in the back here. Uh, my thanks really. <laughs> my, my thanks really go most importantly to Grant Potter, who has been a, a great leader on putting this, this event together. Um, uh, on also Bernie Pollack and Supriya and Adam and all those guys who stand there in the back. I can't uh, uh, name them all uh, because it takes too long. You've been a great team. Thank you so much and uh, um, see you next time at the next World Watch event.